All right. Good to be in God's house today. <clears throat> I appreciate everybody being here. If you will, turn with me to James chapter 5. <clears throat> James chapter 5. You know, any study, wherever I do, whatever I do, whatever study I'm doing, if it's, I don't care if it's Wednesday night Bible study or just do it for Sunday morning, whatever it is, you know, my number one prayer request is that God is glorified and that Christ is exalted. That's, that's always first and foremost. That's the most important thing. Secondly, though, the thing I pray that happens that everyone who hears the Word of God being preached is affected in some manner. Obviously, I want people to experience a blessing. I mean, I want people to be blessed. That's, that's a great thing. But I also want them to experience conviction. Now, right now, you might be thinking, well, how can I be convicted if I ain't done anything wrong? Well, if that's you, let me remind you of this important truth. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every day. You got it this morning. I'm guaranteeing you, you sinned several times before you got to the bathroom. You know, it just, it happens. We, we sin. We're fallen creatures. David also said, who can discern his errors? Equip me of my hidden faults. In other words, uh, we sin and don't even know it sometimes. We just things that happen. And so it's dangerous, it's a dangerous thing for us to assume that we have no sin because when we do, we guess what we're doing? We're deceiving ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us, says uh, 1 John 1 8. Now, all that said, being convicted of our sin is a wonderful thing. Think about that. It is the Holy Spirit mercifully showing us that we need to wash up spiritually, so to speak. That's 1 John 1 9. I remember Chuck Swindoll calling 1 John 1 9 the bar of soap verse, where we need to wash daily. Ask God to forgive us of our sin, confess our sin daily. And the wonderful thing about conviction is that it humbles us. And then our humility compels us to come broken before the Master. And coming to the Master broken leads to uh, and allows us to commune with the Master through prayer and through Bible study, which in turn promotes spiritual growth. Spiritual growth leads us to, do, to have a more intimate relationship with the Master, which in turn creates in us a desire to live a more obedient life. And it ultimately, guess what happens? It ultimately brings glory to God to whom it belongs. Amen. Preacher, that's good stuff. That's right. That's right. That's what we're here for is to glorify the Master. Amen. That's what we're here to do. And I said all that to say this. I hope and pray that our study in James has had that type of effect on you because it certainly has me. So to say the very least, our study in James has been challenging. It's been, a, it's been a challenge to me. James himself has called out, as, you, as we've studied it, we've seen that he's called out all the legalists. He's called out the liberal. He's called out, uh, he's described to us what genuine faith and what genuine religion and what genuine wisdom is supposed to be. He's described the right relationship that exists between faith and works. You can't have one without the other. He, the Jewish Christians to whom James wrote were so ingrained with the Mosaic law and his system of its works that he spent a considerable amount of time uh, explaining the difficult truth <coughs> that no one is justified by the works of the law. He declared to them that even if they put forth all their best efforts, if they'd done everything that they could, to keep all the law, the various laws and rituals. The moment they transgressed in the tiniest part of the law, they've broken the whole thing. Why? Because the law is one entity. If you break one, you broke them all. So what James has done throughout this letter is point out and emphasize some of the problems that had become evident in the early church. And unfortunately, these things still exist today in this church. Not this church, but in the 21st century church is what I'm getting at. There was and still is a problem of faltering faith when people face serious adversity. There was and still is a problem with the sin of partiality being within the church, and as well as the problem of taming the tongue, uh, the lack of godly wisdom, both of which are the primary cause of conflict in a church. The question and concern for James was that the enemy had sown tares among the wheat. And we learned that when the tares are sown among the wheat, it's not the tares that change, it's the characteristics of the wheat that changes. 
They become to they start to they start to look like the tares, and this oftentimes creates conflict between believers, which can affect the fellowship between believers. It can also affect one's fellowship with the Lord. If the conflict goes unresolved, it will hinder the spiritual growth of everyone involved. Everyone that is a genuine believer, they'll stop growing. And until you get that resolved, guess what? You're going to stay right where you are. You've got you to get those problems resolved. They, they need to repent of their sin and seek restoration and reconciliation. Of course, on the flip side of that, you recognize who the tares are because here's what happens. You, when you see the people repent and re reconcile and restore, you know they're genuine in their faith because they want to grow. They want to follow God. But those who won't repent, you'll see who they are because they'll continue with that same smug unrepentance and divisiveness. They don't change. They don't change. And James let them know about it. And he told them, he said, this, this, is, this mess has no place in God's church. Now we come to today's text. In my Bible, I don't know, yours probably does too. In mine, it has from verses 7 through 20 to the end of the chapter, it has a subtitle of exhortation. I don't know what yours might, you might have the same thing, or you might have something different. But the biblical definition of exhortation means to strongly encourage or to urge someone to do something or to have the sense of pushing forward. And after pointing out and emphasizing all the sins that, had, that he's seen happening in the church, among the believers and among those who profess to be Christians, James ends his letter with encouraging the faithful in several ways. And that's why I've entitled this message as James' exhortation. In his first one, he's, in this first uh, passage we're seeing in 7 through 11, is be patient. Be patient. But before we go any further, I want you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. And we're going to read verses 7 through 11. But I can tell you now, we're not going to get through them. We're going to go, we'll get as far as 8, and we'll have to, we'll have to put the pause button on until next time. But we're going to go ahead and read this full passage. He says, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the, for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you, you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count all those, or excuse me, we count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Let's pray. Great God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace and for this opportunity to be able to stand here behind this sacred desk and to preach your word. Lord, I do pray that everything uh, go according to your, your will and your way. And Lord, that you're exalted in all things, that Christ is lifted up. Lord, that's what we're here for. But I also pray, Father, that you speak to every heart here today and how it may apply to someone's heart here today, only you know. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll do a work in their lives. I pray for uh, that each one here will be blessed, but I pray that each one will also be convicted. Lord, it will help them grow and, and to seek your face more, to have a closer relationship with you. Lord, we give you thanks for all things. And it's in Christ's name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. You can be seated. <coughs> now, it's been about two or three weeks since the last time we spoke in James. So, as a reminder about what we touched on in the first six verses of chapter 5, and it's important that we know this, because it's, and here's because this is why James is given this exhortation. He had rebuked the, rick, the wicked rich for their abuse of the righteous poor. And just for the sake of clarity, not all rich people are wicked and not all poor people are righteous. I think we all know that. I think we all know that. But just, just for the sake of it, we'll say it. Now, <clears throat> But as it pertained to those in James' day, they were guilty of withholding money that was rightfully, that rightfully belonged to the poor, the poor day laborer. Now, a lot of people, like a lot of people today, that live paycheck to paycheck, these men literally lived day to day. If they didn't work that day, they and their family did not eat. And so if they worked, whether they, they had to work, whether they felt like it or not. But if it... If it wasn't bad enough, at the end of the day, their pay was being withheld by the wealthy employers, and there was absolutely nothing that they could do about it. 
And because they had very few options to fall back on, they had to continue seeking work from the same people, hoping that the next time they went out to work, they'd get paid. Now, in a bold and blatant abuse of power, the wicked rich kept what was rightfully owed to their workers, and they lavishly and unashamedly uh, spent the money on whatever pleasure it was they desired, not caring if a poor man or his family ate or not. They didn't care. By, com by committing this despicable act, they heaped more sin upon their sin to complete their downward spiral. Uh, James said this in verse 6. He says, you have, con you have condemned and put to death the righteous man by literally <clears throat> and figuratively cheating the righteous man out of his wages the wicked rich could force the righteous man and his family into starvation and thus the rich would in effect put to death the righteous man Jew uh, Jewish writer Joshua Ben Sira wrote this he said the bread of the needy is the life of the poor whoever deprives them of it is a man of blood to take away a neighbor's living is to murder him to deprive an employee of his wages is is to shed blood. End quote. It's pretty serious. So furthermore, the righteous man was condemned because the wicked rich took advantage of the legal system because he could afford the best lawyers. He could use his affluence to influence the judges in order to gain the advantage over the poor. And this would, this would drag the poor men into court under the pretentious guise that, well, all this was legal. We've done everything in a legal way. We, we did. Everything was done right. We didn't break any laws. Well, technically, they did, they did right. They did do everything legally. But morally, these boys were rotten to the core because they broke God's laws. See, God's law supersedes man's laws. Somebody asked the question, so when do we know we're not supposed to obey man's laws? When it goes against the law of God. That's when we have to say, oh, sorry, man, we've got to go with what God says. I mean, if they come in here and try to make me do a, a same-sex ceremony, guess what? I'm not going to do it because I'd be breaking God's law. I'm not going to do that. And so whether, whatever they do with me is whatever they do with me, but I'm not going to do that. And it doesn't have to be just that. It could be anything. Anything that supersedes or tries to go over God's law, that's when you have to obey God's law and disobey man's. That's another sermon for another time. One of Judah's kings, one of Judah's kings did exactly what these rich men were doing. He took advantage of his power and his position. This man's name was Shalom, or better known as Jehoahaz. He had built his house and his houses by defrauding his workers of their wages that were doing the work. And God judged him. This is Jeremiah 22, 11 through 12. He says, For thus says the Lord in regard to Shalom, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who became king in the place of Josiah his father, who went forth from this place. Listen to this. He will never return there. But in the place where they led him captive, there he will die and not see this land again. And that's exactly what happened. He only reigned for three months before he was deposed by the Egyptian pharaoh Necho II. He was taken into captivity, taken into Egypt. 2 Kings 23, 34 says that Pharaoh Necho, and I'm abbreviating this verse, took Jehoahaz away and brought him into Egypt and he died there. The wrong that was done by, uh, by the greatest against the least and the poorest. Listen, God sees it. He always sees it. He keeps a record of it. And He will repay those who make this infraction, who do this injustice. Now, as we look at verses 7 through 11. We see that James is going to shift his focus from the persecutors to the persecuted. He's going to go from condemning the faith, he's going to go from condemning the faithless and the abuse of rich to comforting the faithful and the abused poor. He's exhorting believers to be patient during their trials because he knows that sometimes it is very difficult to exercise patience when facing the pressure of persecution. Case in point, when we studied about this in Acts, in our study in Acts, when Paul was illegally struck by the order of the high priest, Paul responded in anger. He said this, he said, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Now, in our Western culture, today's culture, that doesn't sound so bad. But in that time, he spoke evil to the high priest. That was a big deal. And to call him, what, to say what he said, that was a big deal. And he, his unrestrained remark was an improper response to persecution. And Paul wound up acknowledging that in the next couple verses. That was, uh, now all that's in Acts 23. So it's understandable that those who face trials and persecutions run the risk of losing patience in the midst of those circumstances with other people and sometimes they lose patience with the Lord because we are human. We're not making no excuses. 
but we are human. And as such, you know, as human beings, we have two basic responses. You know what they are, right? Fight or flight. You're either going to stand toe to toe or you're going to take off. One or the other. But we all know that troubles and trials are going to come in this life. And there ain't no escaping it. It is the essence of this fallen world that which we live in that applies to both rich and poor. It was the wealthy Job who said this. He said, man is born for trouble as sparks fly upward. That's Job 5, 7. The Lord Jesus warned His disciples that trouble was going to be there. It was going to happen. He said, in, he said, in the world you have tribulation. John 16, 33. Paul warned the Galatian Christians. He said, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Galatians, or excuse me, Acts 14, 22. Now everything that I just said only pertains to life's trials. Everyday trials. And I'm certainly not making light of these everyday trials because some of these everyday trials can be overwhelming at times. However, the reality is this. Everyday trials are experienced by everyone, believer and non-believer alike. Everybody experiences trouble in life. But every true believer in Christ, y'all listen, every true believer in Christ is going to be subject to trials that non-believers will never experience for all their days. And that is because every one of us who pro proclaim Christ to be Lord in our life, we're going to be subject, we're subject to being or persecuted for that proclamation. We're subject to. And I say it that way because where we are right now in Wadesburg, North Carolina, there's not a soul in this room that has ever faced religious persecution. None of us. But there are millions and millions of people right now that do. They're suffering and being martyred for their faith in Christ. And the way things are looking, <clears throat> it could happen here anytime. It could happen here anytime. But that's what Scripture says. The recurring theme in the New Testament is the gospel that will be rejected. The gospel is going to be rejected and there will be increased hostility towards the Lord's church. So the question becomes, how are we going to respond when it happens here at home? That's a question that everybody needs to settle in their mind right now. The way things are looking out there across the water. The way things are taking place in this world, you have to be, you have to be t living under a rock to not know what's going on. With all these people that come pouring over the border. All of them aren't South American. A lot of them have been caught. There's been quite a few has been caught that are Middle Eastern, known terrorists. Guess what they're doing? They're setting up waiting for the time when they can strike and do what here, what they're doing over there. So be prepared, folks. Be prepared. So let's look at our text. James says in verse 7, Therefore, be patient, brethren. Now the Greek word for be patient is the word makrothumeo, which means one's temper is long-suffering as opposed to being short-tempered. It describes holding out of our mind for an extended length of time any thoughts about taking action for any offense that we receive from somebody else. The picture of this word is of a person in whom it takes a long time before they just fume and burst into flames. Like I used to say, like to blow a gasket or bust a spring. It, it takes a while for it to get there. And after learning what these poor people have, are, were having to endure, we can certainly understand the meaning and importance of James' exhortation here. At best, we can only imagine how hard it was for them to suffer physically, or worse, for them to watch their family suffer from the oppression of others. You know, I heard all kinds, of, y'all said, guys, you've all said the same thing. Now, you can hurt me, but you can't hurt my wife and my kids. You understand the concept here. And James' objective was to convince them to bear these wrongs without murmuring and without resistance. And one of the methods of, uh, of doing this was by showing them in an address to the rich oppressors that those who injured and wronged them would be justifiably punished on the day of judgment, that their cause was in God's hands. Their, God, their cause was in the hands of God. James said, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Now, he uses the word brethren. Where he uses that, he, we know that James is speaking solely to believers here. And I mention this because to the non-believer, the next part of this verse, until the coming of the Lord, means absolutely nothing. They don't believe in him. They don't believe he's going. To, they ever believed, They didn't believe he was Lord when he was here. They're certainly not going to believe he's coming back. And this is an event 
in which Christians were taught to expect. I'm talking about the early church. They were taught to expect this, which we would be connected or would be connected with their deliverance from the troubles. They're letting them know Jesus is coming back. And so it's quite obvious that they were looking forward to the Lord's return when He would set things right. He was going to fix their oppressors. He was going to set everything in order the way it's supposed to be. Paul addresses this in Titus 2, verses 13 and 14. Listen to this first part. He says, Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. That's verse 13. Who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. His outlook presented no bright cloud on the horizon, but that prospect that comes from looking upward was the most encouraging to these persecuted believers. The Christians to whom Paul and James wrote to were awaiting the eager, eagerly for the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, 7. Now, although the hope of the Lord's coming was not fulfilled in those uh, as those in the early church had expected it would, for them, the hope was not cherished in vain. It was not in vain. It was a comforting hope, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. It was a purifying hope, 1 John 3.3. 3. The same thing goes for all believers today. The coming of the Lord is our hope. It's not a feeling of, I hope so. It's a feeling of, hope sure. It's a, it's a hope that carries the absolute assurance of a future blessing. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17-18, he says, Then we who are alive and remain will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we, all shall, so we shall always be with the Lord. Last verse, listen. Comfort each other, therefore comfort one another with these words. The Lord Himself had a lot to say about His return in the Olivet Discourse. Obviously we don't have time to cover all of that, everything that He taught, but for your own private time, your own private study time, read chapters 24 and 25 in Matthew. Read Mark chapter 13 and read Luke 21. But in Matthew 24, 5 through 26, which I'm not going to read all that, Jesus taught that His return would be preceded by definite signs. He told His disciples that His return would be unmistakable. It would be like a brilliant flash across the sky of lightning. He says that in verses 27 through 30. In the next several verses after that, Jesus informs them that they're going to, there's going to be a time of separation. In verse 31, Jesus said the angels will come to gather His elect. His words. His elect. And they will be gathered together to enjoy the presence of the Lord for a thousand years. And in verses 39 through 41, the angels are going to come up, they're going to come down, they're going to gather up all the unbelievers and take them all away to judgment. John MacArthur said, quote, Every Christian is to live in the hope of the certainty of Christ's return. End quote. I'm going to read that one more time. Every Christian is to live in the hope of the certainty of Christ's return. This is not something that we can do, we just casually confess, or if or whenever we're asked this question, do you believe Jesus is coming back? No. To live in the hope of the certainty of Christ's return means to live our lives as if we're sitting on go like a runner sitting in the running blocks waiting for the gun to go pow. Because when that gun goes pow, what does the runner do? He takes off. We're to be sitting just like that, on go, looking for Christ's return. Amen. That's, what, that's what the early church was looking for. And somebody might say, well, they got disappointed. No, guess what? They, what, did you, what did Paul say for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? Well, we always follow on that last part. But that first part, for me to live is Christ, means what? We're doing what we're supposed to do to glorify God, which is what God has called us to do to start with. You know, being a preacher is not the easiest thing in the world. If you want to try it one for a week, I'll let you try it. But you know what? This is what God's called me to do. We're not going to shun that responsibility. It's not easy being a Sunday school teacher because you've got to work, you've got to do the things you do, and you've got to prepare for Sunday. God calls us to do what we're supposed to do. And that's what we're re we ready ourselves to do. And so, we'll be ready to go when the Lord calls us. And in our everyday lives, we are physically living, working, playing. We're doing all the things that we naturally do in life. But our mindset is to be in anticipation of the Lord's imminent return. 
One illustration that I read was a true story. It was about a shepherd's home for children with developmental disabilities. And it said that, he said, you know, you got to you got to ask, you got to thank the Lord for people that do that. God bless them and the work that they do because uh, they they have a special gift. It's a calling. It's a calling. It's like being a nurse. It's like being a doctor. It's like being a cop. It's a calling to do some, to do these things. And you can imagine what challenges that the staff and the students had to face on a daily basis. But the director said that his biggest problem was the dirty windows from the disabled children pressing their hands and noses and lips against the windows. Here's why they did that. Listen, they taught the children that Jesus will save them and one day heal them from their disabilities. And so they're always going to the windows looking to see if today might be the day that Jesus would return to them and take them home to heal them of their disability. Does that not bless your heart? It blesses mine. Think about that. That's what having your priorities in the right place looks like. All believers should have that same outlook and heart attitude of these children. Constantly looking. Listen to these scripture references. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Listen to this, this phrase. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The phrase fix your hope is in the aorist imperative meaning it's calling for a specific and decisive choice to be made at once and once for all. It's to be done with one quick action which expresses a sense of urgency that it must be made. Then Paul says in Colossians 3 1 through 4 he says therefore if you have been raised up with Christ listen to this phrase keep seeking Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Listen to this phrase, set your, set your mind on the things above, not on the things on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. In this passage, the phrases keep seeking and set your are in the present imperative, meaning we're to continually follow this command. We're to make it a constant habit. It's to be a long-term commitment to live a godly lifestyle, which is physically presenting our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, Romans 12.1. To live a godly lifestyle is living outwardly the transformation that Christ has done inwardly in you. That's living a godly lifestyle. And I see, godly, I see a godly lifestyle as being a combination of Galatians 2.20 and 2 Corinthians 5.17 and a taste, just a taste of Romans 12.2, all rolled into one. Now this is Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You follow that up with 2 Corinthians 5.17 and a taste of Romans 12.2, which says, therefore, and you won't see it up here because there wasn't no way I could figure out how to get Paul to put it up there. It's kind of, so I just took some liberties with this. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. Paul's here. Friends, we are all genuine believers have been transformed by the renewing of their minds so that they may prove what the will of God is. Therefore, to finish 2 Corinthians 5.17, all of the old things passed away. Behold, new things have come to enable us to live God a godly life which is good and acceptable and perfect Romans 12 2 you understand everybody with me y'all wake out there let me hear you so the point being to all the above is this. Despite the hardships, despite the numerous trials, and despite the persecution every believer needs to patiently wait for the Lord's second coming if you believe He's coming again, then you'll look with expectant anticipation. You'll start every day expecting this to be the day, just like those children I described a second ago. Because you believe what Jesus said when He said, I will come again and receive you unto Myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's a wonderful promise. That's John 14, 3. And being a believer means you believe what the Lord says. You take Him at His word. Believer's just not a moniker. You, when, you, when they call you a believer, you believe who Jesus said He is, and He has done what He said He's done, and He's going to do what He says He's going to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. In Acts 27, Paul and 275, we've been studying this, y'all. I'm going to go back to Acts for a minute. 
275 other people were there with Paul. They were in this terrible storm. And the mindset was that everyone was probably going to die. Everybody was going to drown. But an angel of God came to Paul. And even Paul probably feared. Listen, Paul knew what God had told him. But Paul's in a situation. We get in life situations. Let's get right down to the human factor of it. You're scared. Don't say you ain't because you are. I believe God, I'm here till God takes me out. I, I'm immortal till God is done with me. But that doesn't mean that I wouldn't get scared if somebody comes running into me in the car and have a car accident. So Paul's in this situation. And Paul is standing there, Acts 27, 4. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who are sailing with you. And Paul said, well, if you say so. No, he didn't say that. He believed God. He believed God. So in the very next verse, verse 25, Paul tells the others, Therefore keep your courage, men, for I believe God. I didn't believe in God. I believe God that He will turn it out exactly as I have been told. He didn't say, I believe in God. He says, I believe God. Paul declared his total confidence in God's knowledge of his situation, his promises in regard to his situation, and that He would deliver him and all the others from that current situation. R.C. Sproul said, and I shared this on Wednesday night, one Wednesday night, that the hard part of faith is not believing in God. Rather, what is difficult is believing God. There are a few people, very few people, that does not believe in the existence of God. Roger and I have talked about this several times. And I've told this before. There's not a time in my life that I didn't believe God existed. It's just I didn't believe, I didn't put my faith and trust in God for my life. Listen, every demon in hell, every demon in hell knows God exists. They shudder, says James 2.19. True faith, now listen to me, pay close attention. True faith is not believing that God will do what we ask. It's believing that He can do what we ask. And to take it one step further, that He will always do what He says He will do. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is the message that James is conveying to these readers. Believing God will accomplish what He says and enables us to patiently wait in whatever situation or circumstance that we have to endure. So whatever, listen, y'all know, y'all know, I'm not going to go into all this again, but y'all know what we've been through, what Daniel and Wesley went through, and that was a year ago, and God has, has heard and answered our prayers, but it didn't go just for that year, it went several years back. And it was a constant prayer request on their behalf, and God has blessed them, God has, blessed, has answered our prayers. We have to endure things. We have to endure things. And to reinforce his point, he gives us a simple but excellent illustration of what this looks like. Look at the last part of verse 7. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until he gets the early and, latter, uh, early and late rains. Now, the person uh, James is describing here is not a day laborer. This is a small independent farmer, landowner, tenant farmer. This farmer goes out, he tills the soil, he plants his crops, he waters it, he works it. And while he's waiting in anticipation for the produce to come in, that's, you know, he's done all he can do. He's got to wait on it now. And whether he admits to this truth or not, he's depending on the providential hand of God to bring forth uh, out of all the necessary elements there is all together that are needed for these crops to grow. He's depending on God to bring forth the fruit. And everything that he's planted is precious to him because he depends on this for his existence. And now that he, he, can, now that he can do it at this point, all he can do now is be patient. Patient. Same Greek word. It's the same Greek word that I used earlier in the verse. He's got to wait for those crops to grow. He's got to wait for them to come in. In context... James is depicting believers eagerly waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. David Abair wrote this. He said, The compound verb waits conveys the thought of looking expectantly for something that comes to us from without. The farmer recognizes that the fruit is not simply the result of his own personal activity, but is dependent on forces outside himself that he cannot control. The pious believer recognizes that the spiritual harvest that we anticipate also is independent of the end, or excuse me, is dependent on the intervention of God in human affairs. Did y'all get all that? 
I know I stuttered and stammered a little bit in there. Did you get all that? The part Abair said about the farmer being dependent on forces outside of himself that he cannot control, James refers to this in the last part of verse 7. He says, the early and late rains. These rains were a gift of the Father of lights in whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. James 1.17. Old Testament Scripture says in Deuteronomy 11.14 that he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early and late rain, that you may gather in your grain and your new, and your new wine and in your oil, the early rains generally come in the fall planting season, somewhere in the latter part of October through early November, or early November through the end of November. The farmer anxiously waits for these rains to come. They're necessary so that when they come in, they can soften up that hard sun-baked soil so he can plow, so he can get everything tilled up. And if it doesn't happen, if those rains fail to come, or they're less than normal, it could result in crop failure. The bulk of the rains come during December. That, now, October, November is your planting season. That's when you got to plant it. But during November or during December through February, that's when a lot of the rain comes so that once you get this stuff planted, they really get hammered, get all the water that they need. The late rains arrive during April and May. These late rains, uh, uh, accompanied by warmer temperatures, this ain't rocket science. Everybody here is grew a garden, you know what I'm talking about, are important for maturing the crops. And the longer they continue, the greater yield potential they'll have. Now, applying this analogy to his readers, James encouraged them. Look at verse 8. He says, you too be patient. Again, same Greek word as previously used the last couple times. Just as the farmer patiently waits for the growing season for his crop to produce the fruit he desires, so must a believer wait patiently for the Lord's return, knowing that at times it can and does try the souls of even the greatest and the strongest men. James is exhorting them to strengthen your hearts. The Greek word for strengthen is the word sterizo, which means to make stable, to place firmly, or set fast, or to confirm. This same word is used in Luke 9.51 when it described the Lord's determination in his attitude to go to Jerusalem, he would not be denied. He knew what was going to take place. He knew full well the cross was awaiting him there, but he went anyway. John MacArthur said, It is a word denoting resolution, resoluteness, firm, courage, an attitude of commitment to stay the course, no matter how severe the trial. Cerezo derives from the root word meaning to cause to stand or to prop up. James urges those about to collapse under the weight of persecution to prop themselves up on the hope of the Savior's return. End quote. He ends verse 8 saying, For the coming of the Lord is near. For the coming of the Lord is near. The Greek word for is near is the word engizo, means to draw near or to come close or to approach. There was a real sense in which the coming of the Lord was at hand in the days of James. And even more so now than in our own day, given the current events that we're watching unfold in Israel and in the Middle East. When you see the news, I mean, you can't help but think, Lord, we see it unfolding right in front of us. Here's what David Guzik wrote. He said, one might say that the ascension of Jesus, or excuse me, that since the ascension of Jesus, history has been brought to the brink of consummation and now runs parallel along, alongside the edge of the brink with the coming of the Lord at hand. End quote. According to various Bible scholars, the return of Christ is the next event on the prophetic calendar that it could happen at any moment. And I agree that the Lord can come back whenever He wants to. There are a couple of things that need to take place first. Like the Antichrist has got to make Himself known. The temple's got to be built. Then it's going to have to have the abomination of desolation and the great tribulation. But all these things that we're seeing, we're seeing them now fall into place. Those things that I mentioned before. And, and, and it looks like it could happen at any moment. Don't you think? I think so. But to reiterate the words of David Hebert, the pious believer recognizes that the spiritual harvest that we anticipate, which is the Lord's return, also is dependent on the intervention of God in human affairs. The greatest of which is the what? The redemption of the lost. God is delaying His return because He is still redeeming those whom He has chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. He still that's why He delays His return. Every one of us in here have family members and close friends that need Jesus. 
Every one of us in here have friends and family members that need Jesus. Y'all sitting out there, some of y'all sitting out there, I got your loved one's name in my phone that I pray for that needs Jesus. And we lift them up every day, constantly in prayer, because we're dependent on the intervention of God. We're dependent on the intervention of God. To, uh, in, you know, in utter exasperation, I've said this, and, and I'm sure you have too. What's it going to take for them to see their need for Christ? We watch them go through hardships, car wrecks, health scares, etc., 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 and they seemingly remain unfazed by it. Listen, the only way they're going to come to Christ is by the intervention of God. That is, that God the Father must draw them to God the Son. As Jesus said in John 6, 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that last day. I say all of that to say this, Therefore, be patient, brethren. Strengthen your hearts. Believe God can do what we ask Him to do. Amen? Believe we, He will do what we ask Him to do. <laughs> These loved ones that we know that are struggling, and, and, you, and you, you just want to reach up there and grab them by the collar. You want to whitewash them. Pop, 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 pop. What's wrong with you? Don't you see what your life is turning out to be? How's it working for you? And they continue right on. We are dependent on the intervention of God. Amen. There's nothing, I ain't saying that God can't take a situation and the Holy Spirit can speak to them through that situation. I'm not saying it won't happen. But don't think that, that situation is going to turn them around. It comes from the Holy Spirit in, in intervening in their life and in their heart before they will turn. And we have to remain vigilant to keep praying. We have to endure. We have to endure that. That's why he's saying, be patient. We, we keep looking expectantly for the return of Christ, but at the same time, we've got to keep be patient and keep expectantly looking for God to answer that prayer for that lost one, who that lost loved one, or that friend, that family member, whoever they are, to come to Christ. Because this, that's what God's called us to do. That's what God's called us to do. And we have to be vigilant to continue sharing the gospel. If you don't share it, they ain't going to know it. I know they probably get tired of hearing, uh, hearing you say, well, you need to be in church. Don't stop telling them that. I don't care for hair lips to Pope. Don't stop, give, don't stop telling them that. You need to surrender your life to Christ. And they may look at you and say, I don't believe it. I'm not going to do it. Keep your Jesus. I had, I had a friend say that same thing to me. Guess what? You still, need to, you still need to read the Bible for yourself and understand what truth is and not what some man has told you. Read it for yourself. Don't listen to me either. Read the Bible for yourself. I can't tell you how many people have, their lives have been changed because they set out to prove the Bible be a hoax and God saved them. It'll happen. It'll happen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Great God, thank you for your mercy and grace and for allowing me to be here today and for allowing us all, God, to be able to sit here and to take in your word and to worship corporately, to worship you. Lord, I thank you for every individual here. I pray that you speak to every heart here today. I don't know what every individual is going through here today, if there's some sort of uh, challenge or circumstance that they're having to endure, but God, I pray that you speak to them, that they will continue to look up, expectantly seeking your return, but trusting in you and believing that you will do what you say you will do. And Lord, we are, my hope is in you. You're sovereign in all things. Where else could I put my hope? I pray that people see this video. Anyone who sees this video, God, that they will change, that your lives will be changed. Not because of me, because God, you speak to their heart. I can't change anybody, but your Holy Spirit can. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, grab a hold to them, just invade their soul and speak to them, God, right where they are. Lord, we give you thanks for all things. May you be praised and glorified in everything we do. And we ask this in Christ's name with thanksgiving. Amen.